part two of our interview with Jennifer Michael Hecht, author of Stay, this week on the Atheist Viewpoint. <laughs> Welcome to part two of our interview with Jennifer Michael Hecht. This is the Atheist Viewpoint, and I'm your host, Dave Moscato, Public Relations Director of American Atheists. Co-hosting with me today is Dennis Horvitz, also of American Atheists. And as I mentioned, Jennifer Michael Hecht is here with us. Um, Jennifer Michael Hecht is the author of a couple of books. Uh, we talked about this in part one also. Uh, she's the author of Doubt, A History, The Great Doubters and Their Legacy of Innovation from Socrates and Jesus, to Thomas Jefferson and Emily Dickinson, this one here. It's an excellent book, I highly recommend it. Uh, the book that we're gonna be talking about today is called Stay, A History of Suicide and the Philosophies Against It. Uh, as I mentioned in part one, this is a, a sensitive topic, this is a serious topic um, that uh, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be talking about it, um, but I, I want people who are watching this episode, um, who are, are watching this not necessarily because they're interested in, in it academically, but if you are actively suicidal, if you are having thoughts about suicide or ideation, I want you to call somebody. I want you to take action about making sure that you get help. Um, there is a toll-free national hotline that you can call where there are trained crisis counselors available to talk to you now. That number is 1-800-273-8255. Uh, 1 800 273 talk. And I highly encourage you, if you are having suicidal thoughts, to call that number now. These people want to help and they are trained to help and they can help you. So, with that, we're going to kick into the episode. Uh, this is part two of our interview. Welcome back, Jennifer. Thanks so much. So glad you could yep. stay. Yeah, this, this was, was uh, great. This was stuff. great. We had, we had so much fun last time. We ran out of time. We decided to, to do a part two. So, I'm, I'm really glad that we could make this work. So, last time we, we talked about a lot of different things. Um, some of the things that we didn't get to that I'd like to talk about are really just how um, how prevalent suicidal thoughts are mm -hmm. and how prevalent suicide actually is uh, to a degree that not a lot of people really seem to know about. Yeah. You mentioned in the book that it is the it is among the top 10 killers of, yeah. of Americans. Uh, 40,000 people, if I recall correctly, in the United States kill themselves every year. Um, and it's one of the top three killers of adults under 45, right. which blows my mind. Um, I mean, when you're, when you're looking at, uh, like you mentioned, uh, it's, it's killed you know, more people than, than accidents, more people than murder, more people than AIDS for all except, I think, three years. Three years of the worst, of the, uh, the, the, the height of the, the fatalities of the disease. And with accidents, it's only recently that mm -hmm. suicides beat out car accidents and not consistently, but that it has at all mm -hmm. has shocked researchers yeah. and beat out deaths by alcohol in colleges. Right. Uh, frankly, I have to say though, while we are in an upswing, mm -hmm. and I don't know when it's gonna stop, so far, we are not in an unusual one. That mm -hmm. is, I don't think there's anything happening right now that is making Certainly the economy hurts, certainly the wars hurt, but the upswing started before the economy crashed mm -hmm. and uh, a full third of the suicides uh, in the military, uh, 2012 is when we no noted that there were more deaths by suicide in the military than by both wars, at combat and transport accidents right. combined. Mm -hmm. But a full third of those people had never been deployed. Mm -hmm. So we can't make snap judgments and in fact I think we have to back up and say suicide trends. I wish it didn't, but it does trend. Mm -hmm. And so when you've heard of it, you're more likely to do it, so it goes up, and then the culture hits a kind of saturation point. 
And so without being alarmist and saying this is out of control, what's happening, we can see that it's a problem. We can see that it's rising right now. And we can say we want to save the couple hundred thousand lives that we're talking about if we just let this bell curve do whatever it wants. And human beings have been able to stop trends mm -hmm. before. Yep. And so it makes sense to try. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we touched on this last time too, but I, I want to I want to push a little bit deeper into that if it makes sense to try part and talk about the idea that um, I is it is it wrong to commit suicide? And this is a largely a cultural idea. There are some cultures I know um, in India it's it's outlawed, but uh, there's the practice of uh, sati I think it's called, um, where uh, yeah sati uh, r ritual suicide where um, a widow will throw herself on right. the funeral pyre of her husband, um, and this is—I mean—it's a traditional practice. That's—it's still people still do it. That you know, it, even though it's against the law. In and general, and the mm -hmm. East has a different approach yes. to suicide than the West. But even that is—you have to be very loose when you say it, because we can see in the ancient world in the West there also being these um, laudatory suicides. Right. And what uh, the. It's a kind of amazing that this the sociologist scholar uh, Emile Durkheim, the mm -hmm, end right. of the 19th century, wrote about suicide uh, in a way that really was the first sociological study because it really depended on statistics in a way that nobody had before. But he, it's also remarkable that he said so many things that we still use, though it's critique. And one of the things that he said was that, that there are two basic kinds of suicide. One that because you're alienated from society. Mm -hmm. The other, because you're too enmeshed in it. You're so enmeshed that you put its values above life. Right. And so there are, in, there are places in the ancient world in the West mm -hmm. where the culture, the community, is so much more important than the individual that we see that. And in the East, we see that a lot. Mm -hmm. Because again, there's there the, the, that cultural norm and Durkheim described it over 100 years ago, and it's still something that we can loosely define and say that um, in a culture where people are too enmeshed, we need to teach them a little individualism to save their lives. Right. But you in our culture, it's the other way around. Yeah, you talked in the book a bit about uh, Lucretia. Yeah. And, and this, this um, so I, I don't know how many people are actively aware of the original story of that. Right. Uh, you know, and, and, and how that plays into Roman history. but. It certainly has a lot of imagery throughout modern history and, yeah. and art and literature and so on. And yeah. um, so do you want to just quickly sure. summarize um, the story? And, yeah. and frankly, I, I didn't find out about the story because of suicide research. I, when I first studied uh, ancient Rome, that was how I learned mm -hmm. the, the origin story of, of Rome, which is uh, Rome was still under Etruscan rule, and uh, it was a kingship, and one of the princes um, Essentially, I'm trying to cut the story down. There was a drinking party, and the men were comparing their wives. And the, the Lucretia was known to be this most uh, beautiful and hardworking and smart and faithful woman. And uh, one of the Etruscan kings goes and they go and look in on her. And indeed, she's home working, and she's so. So he decides he wants her, and he comes to her and essentially says, "Look, your virtue is so important to you." either sleep with me or I'm going to kill you and a male slave, put you in a bed together and tell everybody I found you that way. So she, in order to save her virtue, does sleep with him. But instead of taking that to her grave uh, in order to protect her honor, she goes to her highborn kinsman, her, her father and her husband, and she says what happened to her. And she says, get rid of this, this not just the Etruscans, but the kingship, that, that we should never have people who are so high above others that they think they can do this. And she says, swear on the dagger, and she stabs herself. Mm -hmm. So this story has been so important because it's a defense of a kind of purity as the ideal um, f for a lot of reasons. But it's also a story that I think men and women, but maybe especially women, who have suffered some abuse in their lives can look at this distant story and, and see how it wasn't her fault, and the inclination to get rid of yourself because you're somehow made, made sullied, made yeah. made that inclination is ancient, and we recoil against it. And when we see it with other people, we want to save them. And so it's it's another instance where we can save ourselves by sort of walking ourselves through this story. Um, and I do want to say so much uh, that the notion of saving yourself 
is really at the key of what I'm talking about. And when I say that suicide is wrong, which I have come to believe it is, I mostly mean that if you can stay alive even though you're in pain, you're a hero. You're doing something so brave. It helps, it keeps some other mother's son alive. It keeps somebody who sees themselves as like you with just that much more hope. And that is such a huge, graceful thing a person can do to stay alive through their pain. And I want you to hear that people are grateful and they know what you're going through. We don't know exactly who we are amongst the crowd. I wish we had a green light on us that showed how much pain we're in. But I, I want you to know you're doing something great if you can do that. Mm -hmm. What about the case, what about a case of terminal disease? Totally different to me. You think so? I, yeah. I do. I, I'm, I'm with I the, do too, by the other, the, even the people who are arguing, you know, most, a, that is activists for what they now call physician assisted suicide right. are asking for a change of nomenclature because it's not suicide if cancer is killing you and you just want to get mm -hmm. off the support and you want some palliatives and right. to get out of here. I have a, a watch word. I didn't put it in the book. I've talked about it since. It doesn't help everything. But if you're a doctor and a family member, people who love you think that you've been through enough and it's time to mm -hmm. gracefully get out, that's a different situation. Yeah. Right. I'm right. mostly speaking Good. of despair suicides where everybody who knows you and loves you would say, bad idea, can right. we try to wait this right. yeah. okay. And I think, and I think the most important difference there is also that, uh, I mean, this, this move for, it's, it's called right to die, uh, the, right. the movement for this, um, to make it legal to do that. Uh, you are you you are required to visit two psychiatrists who certify that you are of sound mind and that you are not doing this because of depression. Um, it's I mean obviously people with terminal illnesses it's not uncommon to have comorbidity yeah. with depression, but the 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 reasoning behind this is not that you are depressed and that this will pass and that this right. it's a it's right. an ideation thing. Uh, the idea. Uh, rather, is that you are in pain, you are not going to get better, right. and that this is the most rational thing you can do, which is a totally yeah. different Right. I, I just wanted to make exactly. that distinction. I'm so glad that you did, yeah. because people, uh, pe a a especially when you start to talk about things like um, appreciating life and um, asking people to do something because they can see that there's something right about it. Um, you, 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 if you step into an arena where people think you might be talking about the kind of a blanket statement like all life must be privileged. Like obviously, you know, in this culture, boy, we have to get into a lot of details with how we you know, treat chickens and I mean just mm -hmm. the crazy amount of, you know, what would life mean? But we have to be able to separate these things from their cultural, you know, uh, uh, the limestone and say, okay, what does this one mean? What does this, what is the significance here? And certainly, when I think it's important to say at all sorts of extremes, all, moral questions have to be adjudicated on their own terms, mm -hmm. right? You get to certain extremes and I don't know what's best and maybe there is no truth about what's best but you gotta do the best you can and figure out what a person needs and can manage and so it's not an overall laws, it's just saying look, for the most part, nobody's saying that this is wrong. They say get help but they don't say why and most college students who take their lives never saw the counselor. Mm -hmm. So we have to help people know why, why get help. What do you think about the idea of, of preemptive counseling, to, like for people who are at risk? Um, I, I mean, there's a correlation uh, between you know job loss or, or death of the spouse, sure. whether it's suicide or not, or um, uh, I mean, all sorts of, of things that are common factors mm -hmm. to this. Um, the idea that even if you are not suicidal, um, just like uh, you know, for college students or whatever, just having people see therapists regularly, do you think that that is a worthwhile investment? Uh, it's an interesting question. I personally believe very much in talk, talk therapy. Mm -hmm. I, I think our biological notion of the whole world of mental illness is a little, is overstated. That is, okay. as a historian of science, I can say the pendulum has swung. I don't, it's, it's gonna, but, but, so I think talk therapy is a tremendously helpful thing. Nevertheless, I don't think anything mandated, because you know, people need to want to. Right. So. Um, I think it's much more uh, much more important to, uh, to to make a lot of voluntary, very open conversations. Okay. Um, but for sure, hey, we gotta learn to help ourselves. So mm -hmm. when e all these people are saying, here are the symptoms to look for in someone else who's in trouble, hey, look for the symptoms in yourself. And when you hear them, you know, you you have to be able, you already have to have some 
ideas in your head about what things like this mean. So absolutely, when you lose a job, well, we spoke of, of soldiers before. Mm -hmm. um, in the military, I said, I told you, one third had never been deployed, but over half had had a significant life crisis or, or, or uh, rebuff. Mm -hmm. So they'd either got had an, a relationship end that they didn't want or a humiliation at work were, mm -hmm. the, were the most common sort of, and, and that happened within three months for over half of the people. So it's even more common. But uh, yes, life yeah. events can be, even if you're not a walking, uh, the, the most depressed person, you mm -hmm. can get thrown by I, I think that's something that a lot of people don't, don't necessarily understand about suicide, is that it's not, uh, and you mentioned this in part one, that it's not this, this common perceived picture of this long depression and you sink deeper and deeper into this spiral before you decide to kill yourself. Yeah. It's not like that often. Usually, or I don't, I don't know the statistics, but but you're right. No, it's more often, often that it yeah, is often it is a life event that triggers these types of things. It's it mm -hmm. might be chemical to uh, some level, but it's not, it, it's not this type of so many picture that's you know. In we literature. know that yeah. one of the predictors for uh, completed suicide is having tried before, but that masks that. Uh, we there's one study of people who tried to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. Ninety six percent of these. Uh, people um, were were alive 25 years later or, or had died of natural causes. So th the idea that if you can get through mm -hmm. that terrible moment that you might have you, you might have you might be very grateful that that we have we have uh, anecdotal evidence and then now in the age of statistics we have good studies. Yep. <laughs> you said you, you, uh, you said earlier that you know if you can stay alive through the pain you're a hero. On the other hand what would you uh, I'm, I mean, this is kind of a rhetorical question, I guess. W what would you just say to someone like that Fox News idiot who called Robin Williams a, a, a coward? A coward, yeah. It's just, it's so so in, in, insane to cast blame in that kind of a way. I, I found people through history who used language like that who I thought also said something um, that was worth worthwhile. So, so Seneca, who another famous ancient suicide who was ordered to, Nero, uh, the emperor Nero, who he had been working with, decided he was, in any case, ordered him to kill himself and eventually he did, but he had reported a great deal of depression and misery during his life. But there's this wonderful oft-quoted passage where he says that he was considering suicide at one point and then he thought of his aged father and he thought it wouldn't be my courage that I could take myself out, it would be taking courage from him and so I couldn't do it. And Seneca says, sometimes to live is an act of courage. So I, I do cite, quote, a lot of people who do use that kind of language. For me, if it would be like blaming a, 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 a Chinese girl for binding her feet three centuries, five centuries right. ago. It's th there are these cultural worlds that we get stuck in that are sometimes um, you know, it really sometimes is a circumstantial thing. Uh, obviously, with this particular individual, Robin Williams, we all felt like we know him, but we don't, mm -hmm. right? We can say that from other methods, we can see a lot of sort of s commonalities, like w whatever his situation was, many, many people who have that kind of bad night that they don't make out of had been drinking or that is any, you know, we know that our our judgment falls, and so it's a con it's it's a, it's a pretty steady thing. And so again, I wouldn't I would never call it something like cowardice or or courage or you know, I, I those kinds of things are, uh, seems much more useful to talk about in terms of the living. W once we're into, you know, talking talking about s to someone or about someone who can't speak back, we do know from his interviews, Mark Maron, for instance, he he seems to have rejected suicide to the extent that he could when mm -hmm. he was in his best places. Yeah, a lot of people just don't, don't know. It's what David Letterman said the other night that uh, uh, he didn't see the pain mm -hmm. in Robin Williams and yet. Um, he was pretty open about it. He was pretty open about it and just in some ways his, his as funny as it was, mm -hmm. his manic style seemed to leave clues, you know, at the very least. Sure. You know. Well, but a lot I'm of people yeah, I want to I want to yeah. touch on that for a second because his comedic style is very hyper. Yeah, 
But we got to be careful, I think, about using the word manic because yeah. I think that that right. implies yeah. something Insanity, that wasn't right. present. That's right. right. Um, to, to my knowledge, Robin Williams was not bipolar. Yeah. Um, there's no evidence that I'm aware of that he was. He never said that he was. Right. Um, and actually, on your interview uh, with Brian Lear, there was a caller who who brought this up, and and I think that that was a dangerous message that she was right. that she was giving. Um, that uh, do you, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Well, sure. It was just you know uh, um, I've done a bunch of of call-ins about this subject, uh, radio shows with call-ins, and and people are. Uh, deep and interesting and I've learned a lot from listening to them uh, when they agree and when they don't um, and this was a, a person who was suffering and she was she was sort of um, angry that I was uh, saying that um, that I was talking about ways to try to stay mm -hmm. I think she was feeling I know that that when when someone like Robin Williams takes his life there's a feeling for people who experience a lot of pain, and I have experienced a lot of pain, there is a moment where you almost feel like, look, everybody, this is how bad it is. And, and there's a way in which that's a very personal feeling, and I understand it. And I felt that was where what I was getting from her, that she was trying to say, you know, don't say that there's a way you could talk your way out of this. This is not. The thing is, you can't talk yourself out of emotional pain, but you can talk yourself out of suicide. Suicide mm -hmm. is a behavior, and um, we you can't talk yourself out of rage, but you could talk yourself out of killing someone. We know that, that the whole judicial system is mm -hmm. built on it and to a degree. Yeah. And I, I just, uh, I, I said this at the beginning of the show, but I just, I want to touch on ab about this also again, about um, as far as talking yourself out of the behavior, uh, if you are actively suicidal and you're watching this show, uh, you're not alone in this, and you do not have to talk yourself out of it. There is a national hotline with trained crisis counselors available to talk to you. And if you are having those thoughts, you can call them. I want you to call them. The number is 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. And they're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a free call. Please call if you're having those thoughts. I want to underline that so much that by no means does talking yourself out of it preclude getting to talking to someone else. Talking to someone else is absolutely what you have to do, even right. if you're just feeling blue. Talking yes. to other people mm -hmm. helps, even if they don't say anything very good. Just the human contact, it's yes. just who we are. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying part of the way that you talk yourself into talking to someone else sometimes is right. to remember that right. there are reasons. That you mm -hmm. don't have to provide the reasons. I can't tell you how many suicide notes a person's desperately trying to figure out whether they're too much of a burden to stay. Don't worry about that. Suicide is the big burden. Anything shy of that is that, uh, I'm not talking about the extremes of human behavior, but I'm saying if you, I get, e I get, I was gonna say emails, but the last one that I got was an actual letter that said uh, that this guy had children, and he had a second wife, and still helped the first, uh, he just, he was, He'd always had suicide as a possibility for himself, and when he read Stay, he saw in black and white. He said, it was so obvious, why didn't I know it before? I don't know. But I needed to read the specifics to see, I couldn't do that to my kids. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be helping them out by getting the old depressed guy out of the way. I would be giving them a suicide father, which mm -hmm. doesn't give away. Um, it, that I'm hearing from people, that, that these arguments help them the way it helps me to sort of crystallize Oh, I don't have to do this work on my on my own. W I can I can know in advance. Anything you can do to avoid that is is better. Yeah. I've yeah. heard suicide described as the permanent solution to a temporary right. problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. The Bill only Donahue reason I, I don't really the only reason I don't really like that phrase is it uses the word solution uh, in a not necessarily negative right. implication, and that's not. A right. And I also worry about but. the person who says, "Well." It's not temporary. I keep feeling bad. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Sometimes it is cyclical. You're, you may, mm -hmm. if, if you're like me, you, know, you do have to be a little worried that you might feel bad again, but you also try to remember the good. Yes, and, and the most important thing, I think, is that these things uh, are common and they're fleeting. And if you can get through that moment, uh, that impulsive side of it, right. that, that impulsive moment of it, um, right. 
like you were saying, you know, people go on to live That's decades right. more off regularly. And for our community, if I can assume that mm. many people who watch this are at least questioning of religion, for our community, it's so important to remember that the human support that people give each other in religion, that's all human. And we need to give each other this support. And we need to, you need to come out and talk to other people. I, I say in the happiness of the book that isn't here, it's great to come out of the closet, but you also have to leave the house. <laughs> because you do. And yep. it makes you feel better to be around other people. But if you're part of this community, remember, I don't know if human beings really will help you or really know how or want to, but at least we exist. You really have a leg up. Mm -hmm. You don't have to first yep. hope the guy's up there. Uh, we do have to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you very much for joining thank us, you. Jennifer. You've got to come back again. <laughs> There's sure lots of other stuff. Uh, the book again is Stay, A History of Suicide and the Philosophies Against It. Um, I just want to give that one that number one more time, 1-800-273-8255. Please call if you need to. You've been watching The Atheist Viewpoint, Where Reason Reigns and Reality Rules. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Knock, knock, get the sound from my door A youth with a message from the Lord Jesus loves you, yes I'm sure But I'm not born anymore You're trying to save my soul with your washed out eyes Offering me real estate up in the skies Don't be offended by a word to the wise But I'm not born anymore I've read your Bible and read it well I've heard all the stories the preachers tell What kind of saints would create a hell I'm not falling anymore Can't you get free from the jail inside You sold your own mind for a place to hide Break your slave chains and cast them aside And freedom's knocking at your door Go empty while your coffers fill. Ireland is bleeding and the wounds won't heal. And I'm not falling anymore. You quit burning witches long ago. The Inquisition is over. I know the Pope's even part Galileo. But I'm not falling anymore. Can't you get If I'm happy, yes I am I think for myself, I've learned to stand Kneel if you want, I don't give a damn But I'm not praying anymore Can't you get free from the jail inside? You sold your own mind for a place to hide Break your slave chains and cast them aside Freedom's knocking at your door I wish I could free you from yourself, your disdain life, and you're scared of hell. They've indoctrinated you quite well, but we're not falling anymore.